Um, We're going to be reading from James chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, which is on page 1,213. And then we're going to sing um, again after Paul's read. Thank you, Paul. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask... You must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with the scorching heat and withers the plants. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed in the same, in the same way. The rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away, dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. For those who might not know me, I'm actually a joy and privilege to get to serve with all the pastors here. Uh, let's pray and ask for the Lord's help um, to understand his word and our need to be cleansed from within, um, to be refined and pray to Father, thank you for uh, your uh, glorious goodness towards us, especially uh, and supremely in the gospel that the Lord Jesus came to uh, live and suffer and die and rise for his people. Thank you that in and through him we are made holy. Uh, Thank you that uh, by your spirit you're refining us day by day uh, to be more like him and to live for you. Would uh, this, our gathering now as we sit under your word, uh, Lord, would it be towards that end? Make us more like Christ, please we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Friends set out on a journey to the Far East. What's their goal? Their goal was to obtain ancient Wisdom, sage advice on how to live well. They travel to a distant country. Uh, They climb a huge mountain. They enter a cave ready to draw on wisdom that's going to lead to life. And it's their turn, this friendship pair, to receive wisdom from this ancient philosopher, to, to hear wisdom for life from this seer. And what's this wise man going to say? Here's what he says. Here's wisdom for life. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. We know it's the inverse of the phrase, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, This pretend account is the introduction to the 2018 book, uh, The Coddling of the American Mind, written by a couple of data scientists, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukanoff, if you're interested in that kind of a thing. And the book is essentially about the culture they perceive of fear, anxiety, and safetyism on US uh, university campuses. Uh, And the argument of the book is essentially this. 
is due to a culture of uh, fear and safetyism. Well-intentioned, and I quote, well-intentioned adults are unwittingly harming young people by raising them believing untrue things. One of them being, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Now, both the book, uh, The Coddling of the American Mind, and the book of James explore the theme of trials and difficulties, and they come to similar conclusions. Um, as Annie said, we're starting um, a, a new series in the book of James, and she gave a really helpful overview, actually, both in the way she explained it and her prayers. James is a book that draws deeply from the well of Jewish wisdom. The wisdom traditions, such as Proverbs, um, but influenced most supremely by the wise one, the Lord Jesus Christ, and especially from his Sermon on the Mount. And James is a supremely practical book. It's a book that wants to tell us Christians, if you're a Christian, it wants to tell you the right way to live. It's going to say, go this way and not that way. It's going to say, do this and not that. Speak like this and not that way. So we've called our series uh, True Religion, and so we're going to be learning from James, we're going to be learning from his wisdom, just how we're to live out the Christian faith, how to live out our Christian life when it comes to all kinds of areas, speech, money, relationships, planning our time, difficulties, friendships, prayer. And James, uh, you'll be pleased to know, is the bossiest book in the Bible, there are somewhere around 60 imperatives, or as my wife used to call them to her primary school class, they are bossy verbs, and I can imagine her doing this. An imperative is a bossy verb. It tells you what to do. 60 commands. It's more than any New Testament letter, right? So let's prepare to be bossed about, not by me, but by James, and ultimately by the Lord Jesus. So uh, first one, James gives no introduction to who he is, <laughs> simply states, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there really are only three viable options um, of who wrote this book. We've not got time to explore them, but it's most likely the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's the letter to? Well, he tells us, doesn't he, in verse 1, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, very likely Jewish Christians that have been dispersed from Jerusalem after the persecution. It's recorded in Acts 11, if you want to go home and read that and and, and it's that persecution that scattering that points to really why the letter was written we're going to see throughout this letter that there is a theme of suffering that comes up time and again and what James is doing as a good pastor would do is write into these exiled Christians these suffering Christians to encourage them and to remind them how they're to live so let's jump into our passage this morning uh, this evening even we're going to be looking at under two headings if you're taking notes, true religion perseveres under trials. That's heading one. True religion perseveres under trial. You'll find it really helpful to have your Bible open if you can. Not all the verses will be up on the screen. I apologize about that. You'll find it really helpful to, to keep that open. Look at verse two with me. James says, Consi- uh, sorry, yeah, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, if you were writing this, or if I were writing this, you might write, count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you meet together and sing praises to God. Or count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you um, pray with one another in faith. Or count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you witness the salvation of a lost sinner. But James, we see in, in some ways, oddly, says, count it, or consider it pure joy when you face trials of various kinds. Now, what I tend to do at this point is say he can't mean joy as in actual joy. <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll go and check. There must be some other original word. I'll go and like, open my computer and search and realize, no, no, it's, it's absolutely just the New Testament word for joy, rejoice. And it's not even just joy, is it? Look at it. Consider it pure joy, or your translation might say all joy. How do you do that? Well, we're going to come back to that. But he says, consider it pure joy when you meet trials of various kinds. And these aren't simply traffic jams or bad hair days, not those kind of trials. But as we're going to see from this letter as we unpack it, these trials are are varied and broad. The typical trials that you would find in any church, financial difficulties of God's people, severe health implications, relational frictions, persecution and suffering. 
And these are the kinds of trials that James is going to tell us we should find, count, find all joy in. He goes on, look at verse 3 with me. Consider it all joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, we might read that word testing and think, oh, we think of a test in some ways like, oh, he's trying to catch us out. Oh, he tested him to see that if he would fail. But that's not the sense of the word in this uh, picture. Testing is it's the process of determining the genuineness of something, okay? So in the, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, that word is regularly connected with the idea of metal work, okay? So on the screen behind me, you'll see Psalm 12, verse 6. It says this, And the words of the Lord are flawless, like uh, silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. That purified word is the same word as tested in James. Or look at Proverbs 27, verse 21 with me. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but people are tested by their praise. And so this, this word in James 1, verse 3, the testing word is connected with the idea of a forge, the place where uh, metals are heated and purified, where, where impurities are removed, and where in many cases the metal is made stronger. Uh, when I was a recruitment consultant, I, I had a client. Um, I used to deal with the engineering side of the business, um, and they would manufacture aerospace engine parts and um, components for nuclear um, industry and also for power companies as well, uh, for conductor elements. Um, uh, and I would get to go and visit their gigantic forge, which I thought was quite neat, actually. Um, and they had this uh, hammer that uh, kind of hit at such speed and uh, did a, a thousand ton, tons worth of pressure with every, with every slam down. And you could hear it from two miles away. It was, it was quite incredible. And the only way to engineer um, the metals required so that they were appropriate for the purpose that they were fit for was to heat them in a furnace to over 1,300 degrees and was to bash them with, with this 1,000 ton hammer. And it was vital that these components go through this process before they were fit for the purpose that they were intended for, before they were to go into atmospheric pressure, or before uh, they were to conduct trillions of kind of gigawatts of electricity to the grid. Now, what's the point of me telling you that? not just for fun. In the same way that the intense heat and pressure are vital to shape and mold these metal components to be fit for the task for the manufacturers to take rockets into space and all the rest of it, James is saying that trials, adversities, setbacks, pain and suffering in the lives of God's people are the tools that God is going to use to produce perseverance in his people, perseverance in his people to refine us and to make us ready and set for the purposes that he's got for us. A scholar and theologian uh, Doug Moo says this, he says, suffering is a means by which faith tested in the fires of adversity can be purified of any dross and thereby strengthened. I'll say it again. Suffering is a means by which faith, tested in the fires of adversity, can be purified of any dross and thereby strengthened. Trials, James is saying, they're testing our faith. Not testing us to catch us out, but to refine, to prove to produce something in us. What is it? Well, it says in the next verse, doesn't it? To produce perseverance or endurance or steadfastness, depending on your translation. It's the ability to, to hold up, to bear up under difficulty, under strenuous circumstances. It's not passive. It's not being walked all over. It's actually very active. Uh, somebody said perseverance is kind of faith stretched out. Faith over a long period of time. Somebody else said perseverance is a, a militant patience. I like that. A militant patience. So through these trials, Lord, the Lord is looking to refine his people, to strengthen us, to shape and to purify our faith in him. I don't know if you see it, there's kind of a, a chain going on, isn't there? So the, the trials come, uh, they lead to endurance or perseverance or steadfastness whatever your translation says and then they lead to maturity and completion there's no uh, there's no way around perseverance sadly there's no there's no shortcut around 
trials. There's no um, perseverance whey protein or no sanctification steroids, unfortunately. Otherwise, uh, we would all be taking those. Um, no, the, the testing of our faith produces perseverance, which leads to maturity. The perseverance is not, it's not the end in, in and of itself, is it? The perseverance isn't an end in and of itself. It's the vehicle that gets us to completion. Look at verse 4 with me. He says, perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The trials that the Lord brings in our life produce, they're aimed to produce perseverance, but perseverance is to lead us to maturity. The Lord's ultimate goal in my life and in your life through trials is maturity, is Christ-likeness. So whether it's um, that family bug that rips through the household and causes tiredness and pain and disunity, whether it's that costly car repair that hits you and you don't know how you're going to pay for it, whether it's that unbearable colleague or school friend, whether it's that hostile group in life at school, at university, whether it's that deep family tension that seems to roll on month after month, year after year, whether it's another potentially long week of loneliness, whether it's that dreaded diagnosis, all of these trials in the Lord's economy, in what he's intending to do for you, are a maturing process. They're intended to build in you Christian virtues patience and love and peace and hope and joy characteristics of a truly Christ-like man or a truly Christ-like woman God's goal through these trials through the trials that you're facing are your maturity your completion your wholeness and the reality is is really it's hard isn't it it's hard to hear these things it's hard to bear under these things it's actually impossible in a on our own we need God's help and we need his wisdom and that's why James tells us in verse 5 if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to you if any of you lacks wisdom you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault again James is echoing the Proverbs Proverbs 2, 6, and Jesus, Matthew 7, 7, when he confirms the ancient promise that God will give wisdom to those who ask him. So we're called to ask God for help, to ask him to grant us wisdom to respond rightly in this trial, to respond rightly and with wisdom in this difficult circumstance. We're to ask God to give us wisdom to respond in maturity. And verse 6 tells us, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed about by the wind. Now, the, the doubt in here is not uh, simply just being uncertain as to whether God is going to grant a particular request. Nobody knows whether grant, uh, the Lord is going to remove a trial from our life. God himself is the only one who knows what he has decreed. But the doubting here is, um, it is a wavering. It's the word for kind of differentiating. That's why James uses this sea metaphor, doesn't he? The one who doubts is like a wave of the sea. If you've ever been out on a boat or sat on the shore and you look at the sea on a, on a particularly windy day, you just look at it and it is just ever-changing, isn't it? It never stays the same for, the, for 10 seconds. It's never fixed, only ever moving. James is saying that wisdom and faith, faith in God, asking God, is a trust in his word that's connected to his character. He's saying, don't be like the restless surging sea, the restless body of water that's ever-changing. The wise person has solidity, certainty. It's exactly what our brother was telling us, wasn't he? Certainty in God's sovereignty, certainty in his promises that are contained in his word. The doubting person is, is this picture of vacillating up and down and backwards and forwards, swaying, uh, vacillating between faith in Jesus and trust in the world that's where James uses this kind of unique word in verse 8 the double minded man the double minded person one author explained it as uh, the double minded word is someone whose soul is divided between faith and the world and so the question that faces us all right now me included is how are we responding to the trials that the Lord has permitted in his wisdom and in his sovereignty in our lives how are we responding do we respond in 
wisdom-filled faith? Or do we respond in a kind of worldly double-mindedness? Now, there are a variety of ways that we can respond in our trials, aren't there? Here are just a few of them. We can respond like the anesthetist. The anesthetist. Good job I can say that. Bit of a lisp. One way that we can respond to trials in our life is basically by anesthetizing them, can't we? What do I mean by that? Well, we essentially take sedatives in our life to escape from the trial that's before us. Now, it may not be pharmaceutical drugs, but it could be, um, it could be alcohol. It could be food. It could be by binge-watching shows just to escape. It could be eating too much. It could be doing a whole mi- a raft of things, mindlessly scrolling, various ways of just escaping, of numbing ourselves to the reality of the trial. We're managing it, but not in a godly way. We could be the anesthetist. We could be the avoider. Perhaps you're the avoider. We simply just avoid thinking about or talking about or trying to engage with the trial that we're in. We pretend like it's not there. And a classic way of doing this is just by busying ourselves. It can be with work. It can be with children, family, friends. It can be with hobbies and interests. And you're getting through your trial, chronologically speaking, but you're not growing in it. We want to be growing through and not simply getting through the trials that the Lord is placing in our lives. We want to be growing through, not simply getting through the trials that the Lord is bringing into our lives. So there's the anesthetist, there's the avoider, there's the anarchist. Perhaps the way that you respond in trials in your life is a bit like the character from the Disney film Wreck-It Ralph. His job was essentially just to smash anything that gets in his way. He was hot-headed and loose-tempered, And when trials come in your life, you respond in anger, lashing out. Now, there are a myriad of things that we can do to avoid responding in ways of faith and wisdom to the various situations that are in our life. But how should we respond? James tells us, let perseverance finish its work. It's a command. There's an active part that the Christian is to play during our trials. So there are things for us to do during our trials. We're not simply to grin and bear it. We're not to pretend that they don't exist. We're not to bury them away, plastering on a smile and pretending it's all okay. Look at verse 12 with me. Blessed is the one who perseveres perseveres under trial, having stood the test. That person will receive a crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So we had the, the anesthetist, uh, the avoider, and the anarchist. I had to go for a biblical word beginning with A, um, just because I'm a preacher, where to, where to respond like the athlete. And I think actually that's a, a theme that's drawn out by verse 12 as well. The athlete, the one who trains, the one who responds rightly to difficulty and trials, the one who sets the goal before him or her, Knowing uh, the, uh, the end destination of the race, the athlete recognizes that the pain will not be wasted. In their training, in their hardships, during the strain, they recognize that the difficulties of this training will have a payoff for them to complete the race. And the same is with us. Through our trials, through the tests that the Lord is bringing in our life, we recognize that in his providence, as we respond in faith, that they will not be wasted and that they will enable us to complete the race. We're we're to recognize that the pain won't be wasted, but we're also to realize that the goal is worth it. You see, the athlete sets before themselves the site of victory, right? (laughs) Whether it's the 100-meter sprinter or the uh, 400-meter relay runner at the Olympics, as they train for four years, they're motivated by the reality of potential victory. They're motivated by the reality of potential glory. And so the Christian athlete, the wise one, is to set the goal before them. What's the goal? Verse 12. The one who perseveres, the one who has stood under the test of trial, will receive the crown of life. It's not simply a a wreath like they won uh, in the Olympics in ancient Greece. It's not even a gold medal and the glory that comes with that in the model Olympics and the world title, but the one who stands the test, the one who proves under trials, 
receives the crown of life, eternal life, a life forever without trial, a life without end. So true religion uh, perseveres under trials. And our second point is much shorter, much shorter. True religion identifies temptation's source. So James wants to to raise the awareness as he's talking about sufferings and trials in the Christian life. He wants to raise the reality and the awareness of temptation. Look at verse 13 with me. James says this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And it's worth mentioning here that the word trial in verse 2 and the word temptation in verse 13 are the same word in the original, okay? So the word essentially has two broad meanings. Firstly, there's the, the, the temptation meaning is the in, an inner enticement. And the trial meaning is an external affliction, particularly through persecution. And like many words, context is what drives the difference. So for example, uh, 1 Timothy 6 verse 9 is the inner enticement type. 1 Timothy 6 verse 9 says this, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. It's the inner enticement type. Whereas 1 Peter 4, 7, same word is the external circumstance type. It says this, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And with these two different words, there are two very different outboxes, aren't there? So tests, trials, the outbox, the goal of tests and trials is, is what? It's Christ-likeness, it's maturity, it's completeness. But the outbox for temptation is failure. Now, what's going on in the church? Were there some in James's church that were laying the blame for their own sin at God's door? Maybe um, laying out some pompous sounding theological argument. Well, if uh, God is in control of all things, then the sin I commit is essentially his fault. We can imagine that, can't we? Because human beings are experts in blame shifting. It's an ancient art. And perhaps we've even entertained the idea that God was somehow responsible for our failure at some point in our lives. And James wants to say, no. James wants to be absolutely clear that God is not like us. God is gloriously holy. He's perfect. He's flawless in his character. God is not only sinless, he is unable to sin. The theologians theologians call it impeccable. That's the true meaning of impeccable, unable to sin. God doesn't tempt and nor can he be tempted. Now, you might be saying, what about the temptations of Jesus? Come and speak to me afterwards about that because we could be talking for quite a while. Verse 14, though, says this, but each person that is tempted, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. James is saying that when you experience that inner compulsion, the enticement to commit wrong, that we're the culprit. Anyone remember watching uh, Scooby-Doo? Yeah, at the end of the Scooby-Doo episodes, uh, Fred usually would catch the villain, he'd be wearing a mask, and he'd say, right, now let's see who's been behind all of this tomfoolery, all of this whatever he would say. Who's been behind all these troubles? I saw this meme, uh, and I thought it was great. Um, He says, now let's find out who's been sabotaging my walk with Christ. And he takes off the mask, and it's his own reflection in the mirror. Now that's not to say that there is not an evil spiritual dimension. That is not to say that there is not a devil. James is going to deal with that later. But so often, we are tempted and we fall because of our own inward, disordered desires. Uh, The language here, uh, it comes from the hunting and fishing world. For this idea of, uh, what does he say in verse 13? Sorry, verse 14, that the tempted the, uh, the desires and the enticement. That language is from the hunting and fishing world. And it's this idea of, of the, um, the, the, the hook with the juicy looking bait on it, whatever it is, the worm or the grub. That's, that's kind of our desire. Uh, and what we do is we're enticed by it. Whether it, What is it, the website for you? Or the second or the third look at that man or that woman? 
Maybe it's the brooding over how you're going to tear that person down with your words. That's the, that's the grub on the end of the hook. Uh, and, and, we, and we snatch that thing. And once we take it, once we gobble it up, it becomes almost impossible to let go. And the result, as many fish know, is devastating. Verse 15, then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. We looked at the, the first chain, didn't we, in James, which was uh, trials in our life lead to perseverance and maturity. Well, there's a second chain here in the book of James. There are these inward desires that lead to sin that when fully grown lead to death. And just as we close, two, two applications. How are we to apply this? Firstly, we're to reject the lie. Verse 16, look at this with me. Do not be deceived, James says. Do not be deceived, my brothers and my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God is the Father of lights. He's perfect, and he gives good gifts only. Even trials, he gives good gifts only. Any error or defect or distortion sadly comes from within us. And so to lay the blame for our temptation or our sin at God's door must be absolutely and unequivocally rejected. You cannot blame God because you were lured and clicked onto that website. You cannot blame God because you verbally tore down another church member and gave in to sin. You cannot blame God because you buckled under the pressure and gave in to the fear of sharing Christ at work or whatever it might be, responded in anger to a family member. And we might not, there are kind of intelligent ways that we do this, don't we? We don't blame God outright. But we can blame God by blaming our situation, cursing our circumstances. We say things like, well, if I didn't have so much responsibility, I wouldn't have responded in that way. Or if my life circumstances were different, I wouldn't have behaved in those ways. And we're essentially saying, it's your fault that I sin, Lord. We want to reject that. Reject the lie, but we want to also recall his purpose. Remember the introduction, uh, that adage, what, what doesn't kill you makes you weak? It's obviously wrong. In God's loving purpose, in his um, sanctifying, that means in his kind of making you more like Jesus purposes, trials that come into your life, they are transforming. Trials are transforming as we engage with them by faith and in wisdom. They're looking to strengthen you. Trials are preparing you. In the same way that um, the forge, uh, that, that forge would make components that would take rockets into space, right? They would need to be heated so that they could do the task that they were designed to do. God, the trials that God is bringing into your life are preparing you for the tasks that he has before you. Ultimately, glory, but all the things that he wants to fulfill in and through you whilst you walk with him on this earth. And it's the knowledge of God's purposes in our trials and Christ's presence within them that enable true biblical joy in the face of adversity. True joy, come, and this is the final sentence, true joy comes from union and communion. This is being united to Jesus and in relationship with him and no external circumstance can take that away. Let's pray. Father, I am uh, supremely aware that in this room alone, there are a myriad of trials, ones not mentioned, ones of deep severity, and Lord God, they are difficult and painful, uh, and many people feel broken at times, lost, unable to speak, and Father, we thank you that we have, um, through faith, the Lord Jesus, uh, the one who experienced rejection and suffering and a gruesome death and hell on the cross in the place of his people and in his resurrection and ascension is now our great high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses even if no other church member or person 
can identify with what we're going through. Lord God, you've told us that Christ can. And not only that, he can give us the strength to bear underneath it. And so, Lord God, would you please, as we grasp hold of you by faith, would you transform us through these circumstances, through these trials? Would you even give us a joy that is immovable because it's founded on the rock that is our relationship with Christ? And will we see you once again faithful to your word? Help us to reject the lies that any bad thing comes from you. And Lord, help us to live lives of sacrificial joy as we ask you for wisdom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.